pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Sherry El Tangte, all the way from Chicago, USA. She worked as Associate Professor of Museum University with a career span spanning over 18 years of education. Sherry brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to our virtual stage this evening. Sherry's academic journey has been marked by numerous achievements, including being a Fulbright faculty, a testament to her dedication and excellence in the field. Her passion for literature and written word extends beyond the classroom as she is a published poet, a fiction writer, translator, and essayist. Her literary contributions have not only enriched academia, but also touched the hearts of readers around the world. Beyond her literary accomplishments, Sherry is a dedicated mentor, having guided students from diverse backgrounds towards academic and personal success. Her commitment to nurturing young minds is further underscored by her experience in editing through university and personal publications, helping to shape and refine scholarly works. Uh, Sherry's role as a research supervisor for MPhil and PhD candidates showcases her leadership in academia and her commitment to fostering the next generation of scholars. Her expertise has extended to the exploration of tribal folks and cultural studies of the northeastern regions and tribes of India where her contributions have been recognized and valued. Recently, she had uh, released her second edition of the book uh, Mits. It is my pleasure to state that Sherry El Tangte holds a valid employment authorization document to work in the United States of America, further and reach of her expertise and insights. So um, tonight we thank uh, Sherry for gracing uh, this webinar and um, so Sherry welcome and you can have, um, you know, go on. Thank you. Thank you, Pinky, uh, for that very gracious and generous uh, <clears throat> introduction. I'm sure it was uh, a little, you know, sounded a little too grand, but uh, yeah. Uh, I want to thank tonight uh, the organizers of this webinar. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I, I don't know how useful I'm going to be <laughs> to all of you, but I, I will try and share some of the insights that I've, you know, gathered uh, over the years as, you know, a, a researcher, a scholar myself, and as a teacher. Um, so, you know, obviously, um, we will, you know, I'll, I'll get into that later, but I just wanted to say, apart from my greetings, I wanted to apologize in advance because uh, my allergies are <laughs> acting up, they're pretty bad. So I just wanted, you know, to, to warn you all that I might have sneezing fits and <laughs> coughing fits and I've, you know, I've done all the, the nasal sprays and whatnot, but uh, it's that season of the year. So, you know, I just wanted to apologize in advance. And also the, uh, wanted to highlight the fact that I uh, haven't um, had the time or the opportunity to go too in depth into some of the things that I'm gonna be talking about because uh, I didn't have a whole lot of time. Uh, but, you know, hopefully this talk tonight will um, in some ways, maybe garner your, you know, kind of uh, arouse your curiosity, as it were. And uh, a lot of the information, a lot of the actual facts and figures and things of that sort are easily available online. And of course, I can uh, pass out my um, email address if ever you need to clarify stuff, you know, later on. Um, so there's that. And then uh, the next thing that I just wanted to highlight is uh, I was asked if I could talk about research opportunities in the U.S. Um, I, I've kind of declined uh, speaking on that mainly because I am not really an expert on the, you know, on the various um, opportunities that universities um, um offer in the U.S. because every university is different in the way they sort of, uh, you know, um, give grants and fellowships and things of that sort. My best advice would be to go into the individual websites of these universities and, you know, kind of uh, see what, what's up uh, with, with them as to, you know, how to apply and that sort of thing. Uh, 
I can, of course, talk about my Fulbright experience if later on, you know, if you have any questions or you, you want to ask certain, you know, um, details about how to apply and, you know, that sort of thing. So I'm, you know, as a, as a Fulbrighter, it's actually my duty. Uh, you know, this is what the Fulbright people have drilled into us that we should always be available to help if anybody needs, you know, some sort of guidance uh, in their Fulbright journey. So I would be very, very happy to uh, talk about that later if, uh, you know, if anybody is interested. So I just wanted to say that. And um, so, yeah, we, we were, we're supposed to be talking about certain trends and the scope of research, especially uh, pertaining to the humanities. Um, Obviously, in this, you know, this short talk, I'm not going to be able to cover every aspect of, you know, the the the, uh, the different approaches to research, the all the trends that are, you know, sort of popular for want of a better word, uh, in the present scenario. But I I thought, you know, um, the important thing, you know, but I was listening to a recorded version of. Um, Maria, Dr. Maria Silo's uh, talk. And one thing that she said that really resonated with me is the fact that, you know, our research has to impact our everyday lives or it has to have some sort of, you know, uh, usefulness, so to speak, uh, you know, for, for, for people in general, for society in general. So uh, with that in mind, I kind of um, try and talk a little bit about certain aspects of research that might be relevant to the our context, especially, uh, you know, we, we are, I think, primarily focusing on uh, uh, an audience that is based in Mizoram, so Mizo scholars or scholars that are not necessarily Mizo, but, you know, in that area, in that region. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be trying to um, like I said, look at certain things that we might possibly uh, do in terms of research from our region. So, uh, so like I said, I'll you know, for example, in the humanities, a lot of you know, a huge part of humanities research tends to focus on questions of identity, uh, and then you know, so I'm going to leave that out actually because we're all very familiar, and you know, in in a sense, ultimately, all research sort of tends to anyway address questions of identity whether it is you know our cultural identity our social identity our gender identity and so on and so forth so uh, the obvious stuff don't you know put you to sleep <laughs> and bore you too much uh, so i just wanted to kind of you know put that disclaimer out there uh, these are certain the, the things that i'm going to be talking about are certainly not the only things that are available or 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 you know um possible in terms of humanities research uh, but like i said you know these are some things that hopefully will sort of point you in the right direction and when we say research it doesn't necessarily have to be a degree uh sort of research where you are you know you're you're looking for a phd or an mphil but you know these these could come out as research articles publications and i think a lot of us are students here and it's you know it's 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 not too early to start uh and you you don't even have to publish in you know necessarily academic journals and you know all of those official platforms it can be your local newspapers it can be you know web spaces like you know blogs and things of that sort so uh you know when we say research it doesn't necessarily have to be that very formal you know five chapter thing where you have to follow certain guidelines because certainly research does have its um, uh you know sort of rules so to speak but again uh, I think the important thing that we need to understand is that with research, there's there's got to be a reason for the research. There's got to be an end result, a sort a sort of you know a purpose to the whole research enterprise, and that that I think is where uh, research becomes very relevant. Because if it's just some elite sort of enterprise where you 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 write a dissertation that nobody reads, you know, maybe your supervisor and a few examiners read it and then it's forgotten, um, you know, and, and doesn't get disseminated to the rest of society, then I think, uh, you know, we kind of miss the whole um, reason for research. 
so like i said you know it it is going to is going to have some sort of contribution to society and so yeah hopefully you know the stuff that we talk about uh is going to be a little helpful in you know at least a small way now i've uh, i've made a sort of a presentation uh, well you know a simple one it's just more so for my for myself you know because I like to have these prompts, so I'm just going to share it on the screen. Um, uh, uh, Pinky, am I successful in sharing this? Because I'm not very good at this. Is is it okay? Is it coming on screen? Yes, yes, yes. It's okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Okay. So uh, before we get into the whole, the scope and the you know approaches to research, I just wanted to talk specifically about the humanities in higher education today, very briefly. Uh, I realize that some of you are not from the humanities background, so uh, this is something that might be kind of, you know, uh, not so much on your radar, so to speak. So I just wanted to kind of, uh, because the humanities is, well, it's, this is a very harsh word to use, but it's often used, but it's it's said that the humanities are on, a, on the decline, you know, uh, of late. And if you look at the statistics, uh, that seems to be kind of, you know, true. For example, let me just read my, um, the numbers that I have here. So in the U.S., uh, because this is where I got my data, uh, in the U.S. from 2009, STEM enrollment, that is, I, I think we're all familiar with STEM, the, the sciences basically, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, enrollment in colleges for stem subjects has risen 43 percent since 2009 as opposed to this another uh, sort of data that i could gather is between the years 2012 to 2020 there has been a decline in enrollment in the humanities uh to the tune of 29.6 percent and this is just the us that we're talking about right so uh so we'll leave the numbers for now but let's just say you know to simplify things that um not a lot of students are opting for the humanities um recently and uh, there could be a lot of reasons for that and there have been a lot of you know uh, ideas thrown out there but one of the major uh concerns is that education is expensive but at the same time if you graduate with a degree in the humanities um the pay isn't great you know as compared to like i said you know the the sciences for instance um there is not a lot of money in the humanities and not just that it's there are not a lot of jobs for you know new graduates in the humanities um so that's one reason because you know at the end of the day everybody needs to eat <laughs> we all need to not be starving right and we all need to you know have some sort of uh, income especially if we have spent a lot of money on education so that's certainly there and then the second thing is that i mean there are a lot of reasons like i said but another thing is that the sciences are exciting especially to to, to young minds you know because the sciences tend to look to the future, right? Like possibilities, uh, inventions, technology, what can we do? How can we, you know, uh, um, venture to unknown worlds and, you know, that sort of thing, right? So it tends to look towards the future, which is very exciting, especially when you're younger. Um, the humanities, on the other hand, tend to, and I'm, I know I'm generalizing here because under the umbrella of humanities, you have many, many subjects like, you know, literature, philosophy, the arts, um, and so history and so on, sociology. Uh, so, but anyway, yeah, so the humanities tend to look at the past and uh, try and learn from that, you know, have a critique of society and culture and life in general. Uh, and it, it, it tends to be a looking back, which is not as, you know, pr probably not as exciting as, you know, thinking about space and, and technology and uh, artificial intelligence and that sort of thing. So there's, you know, that trend uh, of going towards STEM studies is, uh, of course, uh, it's at its peak right now, I would say. 
right? And then, you know, and the third reason probably is connected to the first thing that I said, our, the way our value systems have changed in terms of, you know, the economics of it all, uh, or in other words, the world, in simple words, we have become more and more materialistic. We have, um, you know, money is more and more valued as, you know, something that um, that sort of gives value to life as opposed to, you know, books or, or philosophy or that sort of thing, right? So, uh, like I said, uh, you know, especially as a creative writer or a philosopher, you can't really expect to get rich okay uh we, there's a there's a running joke among my friends and i who also you know write creatively that you know we all we all just come together 10 of us come together and we kind of praise each other and we're so happy to listen to each other's you know works and you know we we kind of pump each other up and that's about it right like in terms of the money aspect the financial aspect there's not a whole lot of money in the humanities and so and of course there could be other reasons as well for example if the if there if the government itself is not really funding um studies in the humanities uh then obviously you know there's there's going to be there's going to be problems so i wouldn't dwell too long on that and i want to come back to this at the end of my talk so generally for those of you who are not probably in the humanities uh i guess what i'm trying to say is that the humanities are sort of not at their most popular right now <laughs> okay and that's ironic because i mean not ironic but it's it's kind of sad because if you look at the history of the of, of all civilization you know the humanities have always played a very important part and um you know, Greek civilizations, ancient Roman civilizations, and then even in India, and you know, and so on and so forth. So, um, and the arts have always been a very integral part, actually, of civilization, of, of society, of communities. Um, and you see this when, for example, you know, like uh, during war, uh, let's say, uh, or times of crisis, a song is not going to end the war, right? Um, a poem is not gonna stop people from killing each other, perhaps, um, and you know, or a play, or you know, a, a really good speech. But on the other hand, why is it that, for example, if you look at World War One, World War Two, and you know, subsequently after, when when we had these really major crises in in history, uh, very often entertainers performers singers um comedians you know uh, they were actually kind of used by the for example the american government to boost the morale of soldiers who had seen nothing but death and violence and you know the worst parts of humanity and it wasn't that these singers, like I said, went and you know stopped the war or anything of that sort. But they have always contributed to, you know, to to making things a little bit, to making experiences a little bit better, a little bit, you know, and and given another insight into seemingly meaningless. Um, actions that we as human beings do, you know, the inhumane. Um, so yeah, I want to come back to this, but I just wanted to kind of put that first before we really go into it. Now I'm trying to be brief tonight. Um, you know, when I say tonight, it's very odd for me because it's 10 in the morning for me, but I'm trying to be, you know, accommodating. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I'll try not to take up too much time and then we can have probably more discussions later. Uh, so one of the, um, um, research approaches, so to speak, that I really wanted to highlight today is critical culture studies, which I think we are already very familiar with. It is by no means a new approach to research, uh, but it's still very, very relevant today. Now, critical theory, uh, for, for those of you who are in the humanities, especially we, who are, you know, uh, conversant with research, uh, you are familiar with critical studies, right? Critical theory. Um, 
which was, you know, actually established uh, way back in the 1950s in Frankfurt and in, in, you know, in the UK. And then it kind of, you know, uh, got very, very popular. And uh, so I won't get into the, to the, to the technicalities of critical theory, but what I just wanted to point out is the intersection between critical theory and culture studies. So basically, in very simple words, you know, there, this marriage between critical theory and culture studies is an approach to research, an approach to, 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 to learning, where you study culture, where you look at culture with a from a critical point of view from a critical lens as it were right and so for example and they're very heavily of course uh, influenced by marxism it's, it's, you know especially the critical theory part of it you know the critical approaches um so they look at um, cultural artifacts and practices in relation to the social formations in which they exist Okay, so every culture has its own artifacts that is tangible, physical stuff, and then practices like rituals or 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 not not just rituals, but even everyday common practices, right? So, and how are these practices formed? How are these artifacts? How did they come into being? And in relation to the society that produced them, right? And so, you get a deeper understanding of culture by looking at the relationship that it has with the artifacts and the practices that we find in any given society or culture. Uh, so there is this interrelationship between the signs, cultural signs, and why they were produced, their conditions of production, and then how they were received by the people in general. All right. So that's, that's at the core of such studies. Uh, like I said, I, I'll try not to get too abstract uh, on this, but uh, I think you, you get what I'm trying to say, I hope, right? So they, like I said, they derive from Marxist approaches to society and culture, but, you know, it's, it's expanded way, way, way beyond uh, the original Marxist uh, philosophy, so to speak, right? And so it's this whole broad range of theoretical and methodological areas, which include, you know, all of these different um subjects or or, or or disciplines rather uh that i have mentioned over there right so philosophy you know rhetoric sociology ethnography etc etc film theory gender studies and so on and so forth and then of course you know we as of late uh, one of the as, as, at least here in the us uh one of the more recent um theoretical approaches um to research which gains popularity, uh, which kind of burst on the scene, so to speak, although it's not a new thing, uh, especially during COVID, right? And Black Lives Matter and, and things of that sort, right? So critical race theory, right? Where you look at race and um, racism and how it came about and how it is still manifested, even how certain laws and certain um, things in the, con in, in, you know, in, in the legal system that seem overtly to protect race can can actually be detrimental to that same race, right? And then cyber cultures, which I think we're all familiar with and so on and so forth. So basically, not to get into all of the nitty gritties of it, critical culture studies can look at culture. And when I say culture, I'm not just talking about the social, you know, the uh, the bigger culture that, you know, because when we talk about culture, for example, in the Mizo context, let's say, uh, we tend to think of like, you know, the dances and the rituals and the ceremonies and the costumes. So yes, yeah, certainly that is a manifestation <laughs> of culture, but also, um, culture can be just like I said, you know, a, a video game culture, right? Like, or, or a K-pop culture, right? That's something that I think is very relevant today because K-pop and, you know, all of that has sort of taken over the world basically, right? Especially with the younger population. So, so K-pop culture, for instance, that's a culture. And when we say K-pop, we're not just focusing on Korea, right? We're talking about the K-pop culture in Mizo society, for instance, and what uh, what are the artifacts? What are the practices that have emerged from K-pop culture? And why is it that Mizo youth 
right, are so receptive to K-pop. You know, what, what is it about K-pop that, you know, is so different from, let's say, Bollywood songs, right? Uh, we've had, you know, we've had, we've had access to Bollywood for years and years and years, for decades, right? And, uh, but then the way that K-pop has taken over the Mizo youth, for instance, what are the factors that go into that? right and you know western culture and certain specific areas of western culture and so on and so forth i a, a very long time ago i this was probably more than 10 years ago i um i i kind of i did a paper on the biker subculture of isol specifically the isol thunders i think you're familiar with the isol thunders right and so that's another culture right or, or a subculture um and there could be so many, you know, it could be the, you know, when I, on my last visit to uh, Izol, another subculture that I have, I kind of noticed had emerged was the cafe subculture, right? Like there were all these coffee shops going, uh, coming up and uh, uh, you had a substantial number of people, especially young, the younger lot um, going to the coffee shops, uh, and if you and you know spending time there, spending money there, and probably having a really good time there, which is you know which is awesome, but um, but if you really think about it, first of all, coffee is not even part of our like traditional culture, right? We we didn't really have coffee, you know, it's it's not something that's been handed down to us through um, generations or anything of that sort, right? And then the the very fact of going out of the house to drink a cup of tea or coffee. It's not something that's always been there, right? Like it's, it's been there, but you know, it hasn't always been. And spending, I don't know how, I don't know, 300 rupees, 400 rupees for a cup of coffee, it's not something that's always been with us, right? And so uh, with the proliferation of, you know, so many things that, are, that have become available to us through uh, not just trade and commerce, but the media and that sort of thing. You know, we have this whole subculture of coffee drinkers and cafe goers, so to speak, right? And anyway, uh, I don't want to <laughs> dwell too long on that, but my point being that a culture or a subculture can be can be comprised of anything. It could be book lovers. It could be you know, like I said, coffee drinkers, it could be bikers, you know, it could be K-pop fans, so on and so forth. So what, it's not enough to, for us to observe that, okay, this is something that's happening in Mizoram right now. And, you know, this is what, hap what this is what's going on. But critical culture studies looks at, you know, all of these things, the interrelationship between the coffee and the people or the place, you know, the ambience of the place and the mindset of the, the younger generation, you know, and, and that's a very simple um, example, of course, but it, it, this can go on to so many other things like, you know, it could be drugs related, it could be uh, HIV AIDS related, it could be divorce related, it could be uh, domestic violence related, uh, because, you know, uh, alarmingly, even in this day and age, we are still kind of hearing um, abuse uh, about news about abuse and, and physical violence, domestic violence uh, in Mizoram. And um, again, not to dwell too long on that, but why? You know, what is this? Why, is, why are these things happening? Or you could look at the women and the workforce that, you know, uh, the women in the workforce, rather. Um, so in a, through a critical lens, you know, taking all of these different, like I said, um, um, things into consideration. And that will eventually, hopefully, give us a better understanding of our culture. And this is a very, very important uh, historic, it's going to be a very important historical document. You know, years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, if the world hasn't ended by then, uh, people are going to look at your studies and see that, okay, you know, this is what was happening in that particular region at that particular point in time, right? And so uh, so that's one thing. Okay, I'm going to dwell too long on this, so I'm going to move on. So, uh, so again, you know, this is going to be a recurrent theme in today's talk because I want whatever we are saying today, tonight um, to be applicable, to be sort of, you know, practical. 
so how can we apply this to the current Mizo or the Mizo slash Mizoram context? And I, I don't know if we have people from other regions joining us, but you know, you, you can always apply that to your own region and your own culture or community. Uh, so how do we, because Mizoram, Mizo culture specifically has been, has been and continues to be a society in transition, so to speak, right? You know, a hundred years ago, uh, we know what the state of, you know, uh, uh, we know our history, right? Uh, look at how far we've come in so short of a time. Whereas if you look at other cultures and other um, countries, for many of them, you know, it's been a very slow evolution over centuries and centuries, right? Uh, but with <laughs> Mizo culture, the what what our forefathers did a hundred years ago and a hundred years in the grand scheme of things it's not a very long time right so in a in, in the span of a hundred years we have the, the the transition from point a to point b so to speak has been drastic right and so how can we look at our context our society our culture uh through the lens of you know critical theory right and you know it, it like i said the possibilities are endless the scope is so wide for this so hopefully you know that's something that interests you and then another uh sort of um area is what uh is called memory studies all right and again i won't go into all the the philosophers and the theorists and the academicians who started all of this because it's all easily available on the internet and I would you know suggest that you look them up if you're interested but uh, just getting to the main points with memory studies the three core um, things you know the, the 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 stones on which they are sort of built are the processes of uh, remembering forgetting recollecting Right, so so memory has to do with remembering, forgetting, and recollecting. Right, and again, this is very very uh, sort of relevant for humanity humanities research because it is again interdisciplinary. Um, I think over here, what I need to sort of um, uh, stress is that you know the way we research we, we approach research has to change uh from the traditional you know sort of very rigid um research where we kind of just focus on our own discipline and we don't go beyond that so the common theme tonight is the fact that research is at its best i believe when it is interdisciplinary right or multidisciplinary. so so with uh, memory studies also you have all of these factors coming into play right like anthropology education literature history philosophy sociology psychology and so on and so forth right so uh um so i just wanted to briefly kind of introduce i mean maybe some of you are really very well versed in this because especially for our friends in psychology uh, I'm sure they're very familiar with this, but anyway. So memory, when you talk about memory, you have different kinds of memory, right? And if you if you really want to get all clinical and, and technical, I'm sure there's a whole list of them. But for our purposes tonight, I'm just going to highlight some, a few different kinds of memories that might, you know, come into play when we look at research, uh, you know, uh, related to um, memory studies, all right? So the first and probably the most studied are the collective memories, okay? These are the memories that we share um, as a group, as a, you know, as a bigger group, right? So um, these memories, you know, because we share them as a group, we share them as a community, uh, as, a, as a team, you know? Uh, so they become the basis for the formation and sustenance of communal identities. So if you if, if you want to talk about like a certain tribe or a certain um, class or a certain group of let's say soldiers who went to who went to fight in the same war, you know things of that sort, right? So collective memories are you know uh, one of the most sort of crucial ways in which we can look at memory studies and very often these collective memories have more have to do more with trauma right so 
violence, war, you know, that sort of thing. So, for example, specifically, um, uh, certain people who uh, went through uh, 9-11, right? The victims of and the families of the victims of 9-11, there is, they have a shared memory, right? It's a collective memory that's very specific to them. We have memories of 9-11, at least those of us who were born by 9-11, but you know, it's it's not the same sort of memory that of you know a survivor of that uh, that place or that time, or a, a a family member of that trauma would have, right? And so they have a very specific sort of um, um, uh, collective memory, all right. And there is a formation of an identity. They are not just you know one identity is that they are you know their gender identity or their national identity their social identity but also now they have a different identity which is a communal one that of belonging specifically to 9 11 survivors right and so you know that's one way of looking at it and of course uh just to go back to this one second um memory studies actually emerged uh sort of gained popularity when they were looking at holocaust survivors right like the you know that, that were uh, you know victims of the nazi you know holocaust the jews that sort of thing right and so their collective memories <clears throat> um then you have social memories right so social memories so when you look at collective memories they like i said they were more geared towards this traumatic events or really very you know, it could be even a, you know, an accident, right? Like a bus accident or whatever, right? A train accident, you know, a plane, whatever. Uh, but with social memories, these are memories that are sort of uh, more geared towards uh, rituals, festivals, and traditions that we practice as a community, right? So uh, again, I'm, I'm sure you can draw the parallels with, uh, for example, the Mizo community. Um, and then you have personal memories, and these are often seen, these are often manifested in things like biographies, diaries, photographs. And in more recent years, it could be, you know, uh, um, web content as well, right? And, you know, like for instance, um, vlogs, right? So personal memories, I won't go too deeply into this. I think it's pretty clear for all of us. And then you have Again, this is considered to be quite important because these are episodic memories. So not different from a personal memory in that this is the kind of memory that you have of a specific incident, right? So like, for example, your 16th birthday or your 18th birthday, um, your specific class reunion, right? Or your wedding day, for those of you who are married, and then funeral the funeral of a loved one right very specific memories that are formed within a significant event right and it is episodic because it's not you know this whole memory that's from birth to death or whatever but you know it has to do with a specific episode right so now uh why are these important because memory and over here you know um, what is important to remember is that memories are not static. They're not fixed. That's the thing about memories, right? They're not a scientific fact because it is something that you kind of remember in your mind. And the human mind, if anything, is fickle, right? And so, for example, to, to simplify this, if you, if you were to experience something with your best friend, right you you go and experience something with your best friend and you talk about it like a week later or a year later now even though you went and experienced the exact same thing your recollection the way you remember that incident can be vastly different right it can because it's colored by your experience it's colored by your outlook on life it's colored by your you know personal temperament as well if you're somebody who is very optimistic you might have thought that you know that was a very good experience whereas if your friend is somebody who's very kind of pessimistic and sort of you know critical of things she or he might have you know uh found a lot of things to be unhappy with on you know in that same event 
and so it's the same thing, you know, whether it's a happy memory or a sad memory or whatever memory it is, it's, it's fickle. It's not fixed. And so the way that you recount a particular incident in your life or in history or in society is going to be different and so colored. And that's the interesting part, right? Because that gives you an insight into people, into, into cultures, you know, uh, the way that a certain uh, experience is gone through or, or felt by, let's say, for example, somebody who belongs to the Mizo community, as opposed to somebody who belongs to, an, to, to the American community, a specific, let's say, white American community, right? The way they experience certain things might be different. And so that says a lot about the culture, the background, the history from where, you know, these memories are created, right? Um, but yeah, moving on. So like I had said in the beginning, just checking the time. Okay. I have used about 22 minutes. I'll try and not go on and on and on. Uh, so like I said, remembering, forgetting, recollecting, these are three sort of pillars of memory studies, right? So let's just very briefly look into all of these things. Uh, now remembering is a process, right? It's not something that's just there and you take it. Remembering involves a lot of mental work. It involves, you know, a lot of um, psychological work. It's a process, like I said, right? And uh, and forgetting, on the other hand, you know, forgetting is also, you might be, we'll talk about more about this just now, but, uh, the, you know, we might think that forgetting is not a big deal. But actually, if you really think about it, Sometimes what we forget is, you know, equally as important as what we remember, right? Think about that for a second. What we forget is sometimes as important as what we remember, because why do we forget? What is the process of forgetting? What are the factors that have played into you forgetting something, right? So what you forget is sometimes equally important. And we'll get into why this is important for research later on. And so, for example, uh, the survivors of Auschwitz have this kind of motto, you know, a slogan, never forget, because it's important to remember certain things, right? And we forget things. We forget things. And there are different ways of forgetting. There is the deliberate forgetting where we choose to forget something. For example, you 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 did something that was very embarrassing, right? Or that was very uh, unenjoyable. And you would rather not remember that. You know, you, you, you kind of want to push it out of your mind or your heart was broken by somebody and you had a really bad time, you know, a bad relationship or whatever, right? And you don't want to remember that. So it's a very deliberate sort of forgetting. And then there's accidental forgetting, which absent-minded people do, right? Uh, I come from a family of forgetters. We forget a lot of things, right? And, you know, and so yeah, it's not my fault. It's in my genes. And so, you know, accidental forgetting, you know, you, for, you forget to bring your wallet, you forget to bring your glasses and that sort of thing, right? Or you could even be, you know, on a bigger scale, but at least it's accidental. You're not, at least as far as you're aware, you're not deliberately doing it, right? So accidental forgetting. And, uh, political forgetting, right? For example, um, it looks, okay, this is, <laughs> hopefully I'm not getting controversial, but you know, the bombing of Aizol, which is something that um, the, cen the center seems to have forgotten all about, right? It's a very political uh, thing. I will not get into the details, but Aizol was bombed, you know, back, back in the, um, the 60s. Um, and uh, it is apparently one of the, perhaps the only incident where a nation has bombed its own province, and it doesn't get very, it doesn't get addressed. Uh, it could be, like I said, you know, it could be something else. It could be uh, genocide, you know, atrocities committed on certain sections of the community or or or, or a country, whatever it is, certain political forgetfulness, 
right? And it, I mean, I put etc. there because there could be so many other incidents of forgetting, right? So there's that. So forgetting, in a sense, is also a process, unless it's an accidental one. And then recollecting is where um, I think the you know the term itself is not difficult to understand, but you you kind of you you recollect. That is, you're not talking about it right now as it is happening. You're talking about it or thinking about it in the future, like later on, right? You, this is a remembering, a recollecting of something that has already happened in the past, all right? And not just that, but you build a narrative out of the memories. A story comes out, a historical you know, account or a fictional story or whatever it is, but there is a narrative that is built out of the memories that you have when you recollect something right so i hope that much is clear first right so we forget we remember and we you know uh we we recollect right so how does that how does that affect research and how, how is that relevant to the humanities right uh it's it's relevant because writing about it and when I say writing about it, you, you don't have to be a creative writer. I'm talking more about the researcher, right? The, the person who writes about it and, and you know, does all, all of the work. It is an act of memory and it is also a new interpretation. And that's important because what the narrative that we put out there is what's going to survive. People are going to die. People, the, the actual people who went through these experiences, who, who who saw firsthand what actually happened they're gonna nobody lives forever right they're going to die they're not going to always be with us but our recollections of those times the way we go about it the way we choose to um the way we choose to sort of put it out there that is what is going to survive right and so for the researcher it is imperative that the researcher looks at the memories and the recollections of these people who went through these experiences and begin to critically inquire whether these memories have been tainted, these memories have been colored, whether these memories are objective, because no memory is ever objective, right? Because a memory is something that you reproduce in your mind. And therefore, your your personality is going to come through. Your, like I said, your perspective, your background, your history, your everything else is going to color it, right? So how does the responsible researcher um, gather all of these different perspectives? And as fairly as possible, because again, the researcher's own viewpoints and perspectives are also going to co color his you know, interpretation, but at least it is a new interpretation, right? It is another interpretation. And it is the responsibility of researchers everywhere. And like I said, when I say researchers, I'm also talking to you college students, right? You don't have to be MPhil scholars and PhD scholars. You are smart enough, you see it happening right before you and you have the repositories, you have the people who actually remember certain incidents, for example, that we face as a community, as a, you know, as a people, your grandmothers and your grandfathers, your uncles and your aunts, your parents, right? Your neighbors, the, the elderly lady down the street, right? The, you know, the, the elderly uncle in the village, they're all there. The, um, the material is there. You have to sift through the memories, help them recollect, and then as a researcher, try and put an interpretation, right? Because they're going to be gone. And, you know, once they're gone, that's it, right? So this is where it's so important. So again, the same question, how can we apply this to our context? And I think I've kind of sort of, you know, suggested a few ways that we could do it. Um, because, you know, what is, what is considered by the British, what was considered by the British as a, as an, a small revolt, you know, the revolt of 1859, that was how it was always remembered. I don't know if kids currently in school still study that, but when we were in school, it was always um, written as the revolt of 1859, and we all sort of, you know, we, we knew it, we knew about it, but it was always in all of our textbooks, it was the revolt of 1859. 
later on, you know, with textbooks being revised and with more political, historical, and national awareness of identity, you know, coming to the forefront, our historians, our Indian historians, refuse to call it a revolt because that kind of minimizes it, right? It, it, it kind of makes it sound so unimportant and small, but it was so significant, right? And so they, some historians prefer calling it India's for, first war of independence against the British. So look at that, you know, compare war of independence to a revolt. There's a whole lot of difference between those two, um, two terms, right? And what they imply. And so, like I said, reporting, how you remember things, how you choose to report things, how you choose to sort of present things, that's so important. So how do we do that in the Mizo context, in Mizoram or in the Northeast or whatever else, right? And the, the last approach um, that I quickly want to talk about is what is known as digital humanities. Now, I have to put a little caveat here. I'm not that knowledgeable either about digital humanities because this is something that is fairly new, fairly recent. But I thought, you know, this is something that we all have to be <clears throat> at least aware of uh, because it's so relevant in this day and age you know, and uh, so what is digital humanities? It's a, it's a field that's concerned with the application of computational tools and methods to traditional humanities, right? In other words, you use technology and the humanities together, you marry them, right? And that's a very new concept because, you know, all this time, even at the beginning of my talk, I had, you know, briefly touched upon this. Um, there's this, there's this attitude of sciences versus the arts or the humanities, right? Like it's almost as if we think that these are very different um, sort of um, lines, paths that do not cross over at all. But if you really think about it, technology has always been utilized by the humanities too, right? And vice versa, um, right from the printing press. Remember how like we learned about how you know, before the printing press was introduced, it was very, very, books were very expensive and very difficult to access because there was no printing press. So it was reserved, the whole act of reading, the whole act of scholarship, of knowing about things through books was reserved for the very elite in, in society, right? The, 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 those who had access to the written word, those who had access to libraries and books. Um, and But with the printing press, um, you know, books became a lot more accessible, a lot cheaper, a lot easily, easy, uh, a lot more easily available. And so what that entailed was that books reached the masses, right? Even the poorest of the poor, as long as they were able to read and write, could access, you know, these, the biggest, the best volumes of, you know, of, of knowledge that humanity has produced, right? And so technology actually is not an enemy of the humanities or vice versa, right? So uh, so digital humanities tries to see ways in which technological advances and tools and you know applications can be used in the study of things that are considered to be traditional uh, humanity subjects, disciplines such as literature, history, philosophy, art, you know, many other uh, branches. So you not you don't just use you do not just use the computational tools, but you also at the same time analyze how you know analyze their application. You kind of look at how technology is used. So so um, firstly you use it right. Let me simplify it. Firstly, you use technology uh, to understand, you know, to, to have a better uh, understanding of the humanities. But also, secondly, you look at how these tools have been used and you look at their impact, you look at their implications, you look at their effects, right? You analyze it. So it's a twofold sort of thing. And so you, you come out with a humanistic critique about competing technologies that we are using, a very simple, uh, example for the younger uh, people in the audience that I can think of is, for example, uh, how do we use Instagram? 
how do we use see i'm i'm told that the younger lot don't want to use facebook anymore apparently facebook is uh, passe right nobody nobody over i mean nobody under 30 wants to use facebook anymore apparently so let's let's look at instagram or twitter which by the way is x or whatever right now uh so so look at how you know these platforms because it's not just it's technology but you're using it to sort of um deal with hum humanistic or hum hum you know the the disciplines of uh, humanities, for example, photography, art, you know, Instagram is a platform that has created better photographers than in any other age, right? Like, you know, you don't have to be a professional photographer. If you are very good at, you know, Instagram posts, you have that, you know, you have that technology and the skill combined into one, right? So, but anyway, that was not even my point. The point is, if you look at all of these, you know, the YouTube, for instance, we use it, that's there. But also, what are the implications of YouTube? What are the implications of Instagram? What are the implications of this very platform that we are using right now tonight, Google Meet, right? So we critique it, we look at it, you know, it's an analysis of how these tools are used. And of course, the other thing that uh, is it's useful for is digital pedagogy, that is the use of technology for teaching, which I am, for example, doing right now, which your teachers are probably um, doing right now. And this came to the kind of the forefront, especially during COVID, isn't it? When everybody was online, right? And, you know, you couldn't get out. There were no classes. Uh, the world had sort of, you know, all almost come to a standstill but people needed to learn, people needed to, you know, they couldn't just waste, you know, years of, you know. And so what we did, we had Zoom, we had Google Meet, we had all of these online platforms to actually help us to teach. And so, you know, uh, no matter what your um, <clears throat> perspective is, one thing is for sure, you cannot ignore uh, technology in this day and age, right? You cannot, you, you, because it, that would be like burying your head in the sand, right? Uh, we cannot ignore the fact that the, the technology that is available to us is here to stay and is going to get bigger and better and probably more advanced, right? Um, chat GPT, uh, artificial intelligence, the whole, you know, whatever, right? And so how do we as researchers, how do we as scholars, make use of all of this uh so the dh here meaning digital humanities so there are certain ways in which we can you know dh is used right now right so digital archiving uh where you and this is important digital archiving is basically where you put the materials that are there in print form or in uh in, in other forms, you know, like in other tangible physical forms, you put it in the digitized um, form, right? Online, so to speak, right? In the in the digitized form. So this is actually uh, very key as, you know, if, if you look at DH. And then cultural analytics is where you analyze culture, looking at the data that's available to you, right? So here's what I, what I wanted to stress upon you know, you have to have the data first, right? Otherwise, how do you analyze it? I'll give you an I'll give you an example of all of these things in just a moment. Another uh, way that we can use it is for textual mining analysis and visualization. Textual mining. What is textual mining? You dig into a text, right? Like mining, you know, in, in terms of mining. Uh, so you dig deeper into a text or texts. Right, so you can look at all of the data that's available. I'll come back to this, um, and then you are also able if you have all the data. Let's say, for example, uh, um, all of the how many voters have turned up to vote in the elections from nineteen, I don't know, nineteen eighty to the present time in a particular constituency. Right. And so how of those voters, how many of them have been men and how many of them have been women? 
How many of them have been over the age of 50 and how many under the age of uh, between 18 and 30, right? So when you have all of that data, you're actually able to get a clear picture of people who have been voting. And when you get a clear picture of people who have been voting, the next step is you are able to look at the culture of those people. So for example, it could be that a ma only a majority, you know, a majority of the voters are only men. And until, let's say, the year 19, I'm just making all of these facts up, okay? It's just an example. Until the year 1999, uh, a majority of the voters that turned up in this particular thing was were men. And then after the year 2000, there were more women voters. Or maybe the, the younger generation never bothered to vote until a certain particular point in time. And then there are now younger voters turning up. And so the next question is why? why what is the political scenario what is you know why why is it that you know women don't think that they need to vote what is the cultural scenario in which you know all of these things are happening right so that sort of thing and then of course online publishing okay so online publishing i think i don't need to you know expand upon it right so it's it, it uh, you know desk to desk right so you are you don't even have to go to the library anymore you don't have to go and buy a physical book anymore and so that puts at your fingertips even more knowledge even more opportunities so we are now at an age where you know for the longest time for centuries there was not enough data you know the, there was a limit a limitation on the amount of data amount the amount of knowledge the amount of accessibility of certain facts and figures uh you know, for researchers and academicians. Now the reverse is, you know, happening right now, especially in the larger context of the world. Uh, there is so much data available to us, so much so that we have to actually sift through them. Um, and so you can use this to your advantage as a researcher, right? There are certain uh, applications, for instance, that are apparently not very hard to use for non-technical people, for non-engineers, so to speak, that have been programmed to look at data, to look at textbooks, for instance. You know, if you there's an, there's a study that I read about where they looked at all of those children's stories that, that were published in uh, in America, I believe, from a particular in the 19th century right from a particular year to a particular year and then they looked at the the story titles they looked at the trends there's a software to do that right and they were able to see for example what were the most popular um uh topics and themes meant for boys as opposed to the most popular topics and themes meant for girls you know that sort of thing it, it can get very very interesting because it it uses analytics, it uses data <clears throat> to come, you know, to all of these uh, conclusions, right? So I, like I said, I'm not, you know, the most conversant with DH either, but it's something that's worth looking into, right? And again, you know, uh, it's, it's also interdisciplinary again, right? Um, you, and that, that's where so research will survive. If you don't, if you look beyond your particular discipline and you collaborate with other people from different disciplines and you you kind of merge your knowledge, that's where research is going to survive. And on a side note, you know, there's this huge debate between uh, uh, regarding artificial intelligence and what it's going to do uh, to the humanities. So I just wanted to quickly um, address that. Uh, recently in a painting competition, in an art competition or whatever, I think you, you might have read that a painting generated by AI won first prize. And there was a lot of outrage because, you know, you had human painters, artists being sidelined for something that a machine had created, right? So, you know, maybe think about all of those things. Is, is AI taking over? And if so, I mean, if we, we know that it's there, you know, it's here. Like I said, you can generate entire essays, um, all sorts of things, you know, uh, and it's, you know, it's getting to the point where, where there's this hot debate over, you know, over these things. So what can, how can the humanities contribute to this? We have to remember that artificial intelligence is something that has been, you know, created by man with a particular set of choices 
you create a robot, you create a computer, you create a program, but you as a creator are making the choices of what kind, what kind of robot to, to make, what kind of program to, what kind of software to create. It's your choice, right? And so the choice, the choosing the right things is what is very crucial. I'll rush through this. And so what the humanities can bring to the table are ethics, right? Because a computer, uh, you know, uh, a machine is, you know, it, it, it's neutral. It doesn't really have, you know, uh, morality, so to speak, right? It's just neutral. It's a machine after all, right? And so what the humanities can bring to the table are, you know, to never lose sight of ethics. Because ethics are the ultimate values on which our choices are anchored right this fear has always been there by the way for decades for you know uh way back um in the 1950s 60s hg wells had already which is who's a science fiction writer had already talked about machines taking over and addressed that issue right like it's always been a fear fortunately so far machines have not taken over, you know, in spite of humanity's fear, because the humane, you know, as the name suggests, the humane side of things, the human, the, you know, humanity is something that so far the machines are not able to replicate, right? And so I just wanted to, you know, quickly sort of address that procedures. And so with ethics and the kind of choices that you make, it becomes very important for a humanitarian or a, hu a humane person to, to bother about not just the, uh, the outcome, but also how you have that outcome. Because it's very easy to look at the bottom line, right? Like it's going to make me a billion dollars or it's going to make me this powerful. So that's the outcome. But how do you how do you approach it? How do you go about making those billion dollars? Is it ethical? Right? And so that's very important. So um, coming, I'm close to the end. Uh, so how can digital humanities be applied to our context again, right? Uh, at least in the context of Mizoram, I feel that digitizing is, is crucial for us, right? You know, in, in, in Western countries, you know, in, you know, in other communities and societies and, you know, cultures, perhaps they have been more progressive with digitizing their, you know, artifacts, their cultural artifacts, their, you know, physical books, right? Um, and once the data is there, then those softwares can be applied, uh, you know, to serve humanities, uh, the humanities. Uh, in our context, I think that, and I would know this because I am all the way over here and every once in a while, somebody wants me to write a paper. Somebody wants me to write a, to do a presentation on a certain academic topic. And when I look for my sources online, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult because there's so little in terms of on an online presence, right? On Mizo culture, on Mizo literature, on Mizo whatever, there is not enough, right? So digitizing is very, very crucial. And then interdisciplinary collaborations, right? So, and, and I'm so happy that, for example, on this, this platform that we have tonight, you have, I believe you have teachers from all sorts of disciplines under Shangbana College. You have, I think, people from the arts and the sciences and commerce and, you know, all sorts of disciplines. This is exactly what research should be like, right? Where you collaborate and bring the best of the different knowledge systems and knowledge areas onto the table so that you can have a holistic sort of research that sort of takes care of the, you know, the scientific, the, techno the, the te technical, and then the you know, humanitarian, humanistic approach, right? And it, they kind of all come together because that's what knowledge is, right? It's not, it, it's not supposed to be just one-sided. Um, and so in conclusion, to get back to my question or my what I had um, addressed at the very beginning, are the humanities still relevant? And I would say, yes, they are. You know, they, uh, this is uh, the humanities science, let's say, because, you know, you're, we're, I'm sorry to be doing this, but it seems to be a common trend to be pitting the sciences against the arts or the humanities, but which, 
obviously should not be done. But uh, having said that, you know, uh, we operate on slightly different terms in the sense that science tends to look at the data that's there, right? And, you know, draws conclusion and conclusions from there. Uh, the humanities go beyond that in that they confront tough life questions that cannot be rendered into data. What is the purpose of our existence? Why do we do this? Why, what is life? You know, what is love? Um, what is desire? What is the difference between love and desire? Um, you know, uh, what is my purpose on this earth? What happens in the afterlife and so on and so forth? What is ethical? You know, all of those tough life questions that is so necessarily, you know, that is so necessary for a person to be a complete person, right? You can have the most advanced technology, the most uh, accurate scientific facts, um, and you can try and act on that. But life, unfortunately, is not always you know, uh, reduced or reducible into all of those facts and figures and data, right? And like I said, there is a fear, you know, there's this fear that society will just go into all the, you know, into the, the, that, that very materialistic um, data driven sort of enterprise where everything is only done because of the end, you know, the, the end goal in mind. Right, but where does humanity come in, right? And if there is, you know, if if that disappears from our societies, from our cultures, uh, we might be very advanced, but we are not going to survive as a race, right? Because forgiveness, you know, things that are, you know, science might say that, you know, A uh, results in B. So therefore, if you do A, it has to be B, right? But then certain life questions, life experiences, um, situations. You know, things like forgiveness, where A deserves B, but is given C instead, right? Things of that sort. We, if, we, if we lose sight of all of that, uh, we're not going to survive as a, uh, as a race. And so humanities bring to the, you know, bring creativity, sensitivity, different points of view, questioning minds that the sciences also, and, and this is like I said, you know, we shouldn't be mistaken into in thinking that the sciences are also kind of against the humanities, because if you look at the best tech companies uh, in the world today, they have a huge number of people from the arts, from the humanities disciplines working for them because they need that human touch. The humanity aspect of knowledge always has to be there in knowledge, right? And so they, you know, it brings, you know, to the table, the uncertainties of thinking where, you know, sometimes uh, there can be more than one answer, right? Multiple nature of meaning, the limitations of knowledge, the fragility of findings and the need to assume where, when there is no data, right? And so, uh, yes, the humanities are still relevant. However, the humanities also need to not be rigid. We need, like I was talking about digital humanities and, you know, things of that sort. Don't be afraid of technology. Don't be afraid of new things, or we shouldn't be, <laughs> you know, I'm not talking to anyone in particular. We shouldn't be afraid of technology. We shouldn't be afraid of new things. We should in find a way to make use of these things, right? And that's where, you know, that more holistic development as a culture, as a community, as researchers, as academicians will come into play. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Sherry for your uh, presentation. Um, Actually, I was, um, I think it was the first time I saw you was uh, presenting about subculture in PUC and I was so, so impressed. And um, I mean, till today, I was like, if you're going to get in, anybody to speak, then it has to be you. And so we got you. So we feel so lucky. Um, if there's you. anybody out uh, among the audience who wants to make a comment, we'll uh, open the time for them. Anybody? Any questions or comments that you would like to make on the presentation? 
Okay, while you're thinking, while the others are thinking about their questions, um, I think tonight you uh, you uh, address a whole lot of range of uh, you know topics and um, what could be you know it's very relevant actually. I hear that I saw boom, but Jan Kani that is always how I hear that AI can can you say yeah? research at Janin Apoimo in Shia Atan to research the Apo and there are so many tools that you know we could use. And while you were you know you were talking about AI, my I had a question which was like, uh, is human touch still important? It's still crucial. So, uh, there's this um, question about subculture, which I have totally different from the AI. Um, what different subcultures have you identified there? And then, look, study on the data. America can subculture, Mizo, Mizo culture. I can share my own thing. Cafe culture, the currency, so that's rising as one in something very relatable. I said, do not swan in a can not share my love, Helen Panga. Amaro, so Kalam Panga subculture. Tangalam do we should hail. I'm sure there are others, you know, with questions, but before they ask, that's what Kalas of the name is. Okay, thank you for the comments and the question, Pinky. Um, Minzo to the Hansoy, Joe to her consumer, the Lawani to Omdon, young little to Kashia, I must say, gay money. I hear in Chicago context, big say Taylor, uh, Hetaka move me, I'm not so in Mizorama. Van de Tap talking to the Hialila can move MM Lawatan in hey, Chicago South Side who. Bizo chen kasai boka tu poi ma kasai em no tu rang hey violence and sani to mo uh, and to the point where hey ke mani ho pokan ka lok ngam lo tu to tok meang chan kata khanin a gang culture here it's a very 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 big gang subculture and himo chan in gang pa chu kha ni lo obviously so they are like hey any any uh, warring the may young more can be in a rival or rival gangs and near van canyon uh uh and subculture is strong to go hey uh and then to a pot to set to me meet it to a long tea joining let hey and you know and boil in so it's up to say hey this is not to a man or join the under more joining uh hey and strong than big that in there joining a art an art the po dang he we can covid like kan lo the eleven um vaccine ka kan la ve do sia ka ala van de ulai lab na tur big de te min pek chin lai kan south side a ber ke han kan vaccine lab na tur kha ani sia nuam ti va ko lo da una kha kan kala ma se en pe chu kan va tong chuang chu ni lo wa ma se he an art de kha mu the he an graffiti de kha om zia ani kan va shi tiam vek lo na chu like i've read about it like hey there are certain symbolisms uh, certain meanings to their art mo he ka ka tiam la chu an tiam em em he an murals ang la de kha mo banga khan lian pui pui tiang kha de kha de chu chu ke ma ina he ti me mizoram a chon gang ang gang pa kha kan ni lo tin a thalo lam de pu ani bokta at lo mom ta ma sing in hey kami kami subculture ka strong hop me kati hati lai nai me so otherwise one hey like i said anything can constitute a subculture as long as it's a certain number of people who share a common interest who are bound by a common thing i'm sure there are many 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 um but off the top of my head can i do a play to me lo wani to mo i mean that's interesting with the katan kamo so uh miss black zoli i think she would like to make some comments and ask um questions as well coordinator at qac oh thank you miss pinky uh miss sherry i am a very uh yeah, literature enthusiast but i am from covers and whatever you said uh Angai inom kiti ah ah amay rosu siya tiam lao teha lao ne na salut tukan ito so ani ay isoy pa kan 
literature and uh, is a kind of uh, dying to the tell of a mass a demand at Yam, the red and car, come here to the rua can in a low. Again, it's a leg literature can be handy at some sort of any uh, a creativity lie he he tema at it now is it dying? Did the career of a systematic creative, that crazy creativity, at the end Again, it can be a romantic a language, romantic to Antica Nilovin till hey, easy, pleasy kind of Katiang Zontica or Mimti. They can also be very good to me, it's okay. Here, the Akobar side the Changin. So that's my comment and a question to to hey, memories it is a little bit of a literature. So, how do you how do you make it into a form of research? The Hakalo. Question: There, what do you make it into a, a recording kind of thing, or do you analyze it, or? Katiang ang song kan entia kal puising at di hatu sukan sot tunis. Thank you so much, Miss uh, B Zeti, for for that question and the comments. Very very important. Ah, mas azok ka toy tayong kan address to address kan to mga literature decline kati kan. Ah, actually decline kati talaga ka to humanities how shim shim azok himo ah, including hey philosophy, sociology. Well, not maybe sociology too lazy. Ah, do mete philosophy te kan ti ang ti te hey art studies kan ti ang ti te then literature tapo anyang ah he to a decline ti he to statistics and so on and you are taking away to uh your role in the law and my role so it's an kato so young can't come to come to young uh literature be got to an is so young the only car in uh for a number of reasons cover him and what to a content he consumed to her i took a i also more consumed to hand me while very uh hey video on the more video content the online cut down content that yet hey do not join youtube videos the po he are in the letter to nice chunk her to an kami a shorts on a car to it there and and encapsulate the panga kaka tiang to ka and do let us into youtube minutes some nivel and po hurry and tila to turn it to hey and any instant gratification we live in a society uh where instant gratification is the norm fast food the po it in here a, a, a popular country, so I'm going to talk more fast food as the name implies. Because I'm going to talk about instant gratification. I'm going to talk about the program that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the truth and the truth and the truth. I'm going to talk about the truth and the truth. I'm going to talk about the truth and the truth. No bang po hi le lama chuan in dim lu tuk te po hi an hilaw katia. I'm going to talk about the truth and the truth. Latvia Trang Trang Latvia Trang Trang po hi tu om to ma sila tun ma akan nul akan bati hun laya le kabuka their main form of entertainment ani ang katu ani hi hi to la wani tu mo tu van zan le kabuka literature hi ma sila le kabu remot ani ang ay lo tani tu it is narrative right literature is narrative so that narrative can come in the form of a video it can come in in the form of a TikTok it can come in the form of an Instagram post. You know, kami a narrative zoka ka ala om tayo ni to because kan evolve them ila o tuan tuti roi tuan ni ele kabuhi a detay ng pihi to an lao tang an yang hai nga tepo mo skula te hiyan hi reading hi an encourage na saluto ka library la an ti cha buka to van tuan in i a passion la na itap tako tan hi tuan in i mun hi tuan la om ni amaro tu niya so yang ka a form ka nang to lao tuan na kay mani tang niya po kan mitte lao cha do do cha do to an hey Audible te kamay sa de ito. Tamta ka chan mo le kabu ne na han chut to ta han siya ngur ngur ka ahar to ni. So, ma siya ka ngay tlak teknoloji e chang tau ka ngay tlak tin ka pa in ka wak pa tin ka ngay tlak niya ka chores ka ti pa tin ka ngay tlak ti ta. So, you know, til hi beidon ni tutuk lo to ni han ka siya vi ah. You know, there's always that other, there's always a way to sort of turn it around. Ti hi ka be say da na ni ve ni ito. So, katlay ka chong katlay ka chong dutok. May la, a second question na ka in memory. Ka, mizaw konteks sa tingin kan sa hangtay nga siya at hangtay na to rin. Number one, 
dito ko siya tiyan bala tiyan doktor uh, vanil ompuya no not vanil doktor lal ompuya opia le uh, professor margaret zama kan they did memory studies specifically romboy uh, literature right they opia page in romboy literature ti le kabuta po a publish ta nge nge second edition te po tswak le to man ni lo kan i interested tan lo lo le sak ve nge nge ula romboy narratives an ni cho lo po mi dang ti te po an um to to ta ni chu mo discipline dang chakin an min kan so me do na ka kare ro me the lo ma se hey o roaming moi ma mi puc history department khan in kshar swalo chal ram boy la ya me se how big experiences how ka collect ni tum wa he san tu pong swal te an tunga you know all the atrocities that were committed and hey le ki na te tam tak an muta ka ka pe se how stories we ka collect and then she made an analysis of you know as a study ang kana ti ni chu toi song in so an op te po han ram boy literature and ta he ram boy chung cha ma thu ja kha tam tak kha on ve ta ni amai ro chu soi ang khan research adni lo ta ni het lai mi kha entina mnf alo changta a mnf a recollections khale khabua years later lo chwa ta ni khata ang chi ho kha chu memory chi shang shang la khom khan researcher kha chu an in a balanced view nei tum khan ram boy kha how it is recollected and expressed the ang chi ta kha an ti ta ni chumwa kha tang te chan entina ke ma pun tun ma do to kan re vele de to a hey kho khom chung cha a hian van lal chan lal chan puya van chu kan te zia chu lal chan puya to chong ti amani ni o itan to ka sei sual chu ka lao vel khan in kho khom la ti te kha kho ta mi zo chong ni ni mi wo tu ma ni shi ngai si lo wa chan le he kha mi na kho khom la siam pui sai lo sak kha mo kho khom la mang khan chu kho khom la kha chan la in e kokhom shom ziate a traumatic ziate kha hlami asata satla pakhate khan ta masa khami phe na kan history tam tak omni ti ka shata wang kha hey paper to focus ya kamin publish sak ne nia a hla ta ka po chu english in ka thiamang ang in kan da ve a e ka tiang khan mo hey example chu tam thiang chu so much of our history is oral even to this day chu so ang kan a repository ash at taka she ho hi an mual an liam ze ani chu so van chan mo lan liam zo ma yan e tin khata ang kho kho pui pui te ram boy pui pui te kha ni fit ngai lo an ma ni village life shim shim te an hun kal to te ai zol chung cha whatever it is tin he hana lan lan pui kha ni when black birds fly the novel is ya khan ai zol bom chung chang cho background na mang ta ni fiction cho ni ta ma se mi tam tak a kom ko la an memories a kon ko ma ka ka mi base da ula kan in novel as yak ta ni cho mo ka tang kha you know so those are some of the ways that we can do it through literature a cha ka te to i was just thinking it gives me an idea covid pandemic lai mi memories te po kha a multidisciplinary song ang kha ni tai la a thang go ta thank you so much Of course, yeah. And there, can say a little more. Oh, we talk about can a a former colleague, Dr. Margaret L. Patzo, who is an editor, can let's share with you. Hello, not to COVID lockdown, lockdown diaries. The amount of because so I meet. Hey, can we creative writing? So can collect a can we lockdown. Tung tang big ang kamo masay isoy ka at a next level le tani because multidisciplinary ka at sa kubang ka ka ni air scope chalo tuk na yani ka. English department ho ka han comment ba si si ulahi boss berama. Miss, kau mana kalau komen? Oh, ngaji nombi tu kan dalam boleh lucu cerita tentang zaman kita sebagai bika kan? Eh, enti nanti itu nak hianin ikan titi, hau nak pohen kan soi tahu cerita tu? Mizo konteks big, ah hianin hei kan in publish dah nih. Enti nak pohen dalam soi zoya hanya novel tentang zaman kau kan? Mizo ina novel ing eh yang mizo writing in English takkan nih. Kau mesti tukar nih. Pemal suami je kau zora mikan nih le. Dapat zor ta. Alian tham ala chuan han study tham te ulega chuan chuan in hemi antenan big a chinu a chibi te an quote te zo tai la if the lions do not write a story of themselves the hunter will write it for them anyway yang si 
kami mentality ya kha eng tin nge english department hen hei ai hen and a department ang zong kerlo point a study zang zong pon niang i kan identity kan culture kan tradition tin kan memory a po kha publication le research hi a zau zok in not just from mizoram university he mi apia lam theng hen eng tin nge kal pui thei dan te oma ngem le ti thei ka ril rom thina mo chu chu comment pa in zona ang reng de woni chu Oh, so alam o me niya apoy mo ko me dito na zawa quotation ron ang lao kan lao kan lao familiar bak lao takin hey o mas yabe ra so anin kaya malin kan thon tuhi kan soy lao so min soy saktu anum don thow thow kaka inti na min soy saktu te kanin min soy alan dan ka history ako kan om don tour anito ah so van so an kaka kan dosi lao so min representation kaka kan dosi lao so an kaya malin we have to tell our stories more like if hey we have to articulate our experiences. Tika, oy mo luto ka tutak so na to na tapo yan North East studies shim shim tehi hey alara ni so it's almost like hey a fashionable ganti don ng fad mo academy at so ani de wong ing tutok kat lai chang kan ang mga motil dang day de zian do a seminar paper and present do so North East North East yan ron tifik ta at luto alam mo luto kbi kan har ab ma ero so kata takan Ah, muna mi tehyan, ane itu tehyan kan siya tamlaw tuan. Anwa, anwa, ane ni, anwa zote mo, an source tehyan, til diglawa anlaw siya, pwede siya kaka, hea tilaya, paya, alian zo ka, anwa publish dan ka nila ito, siya siya. So, wansa kaka kang zong zong ka, wat niya siya, po nito lo, ma siya, researcher na anhan ron le, don le le, an ron tur material le, kato kaka anilo is in it. So, so wansa, it's imperative that we, who are living that life, who are living in that situation, kanin, that we express ourselves, tilay kato, apoy mo, kop maya, ang tin nga niyang tilay kato, i, I'll be very honest. First of all, sum le pa yung lawa, alang kay bok lawa, di kay M M kakatiyang zong ang nga ang yani motivation ni so an abay don ka kani so. Masay chan yung mga ina avang zokin le nam le ram mang ram le nam mga ina avang ani so an mani po yanin hey ang mga mutsin hizo at ibet hindi so mani hantia kan like minded abul bera so an kami kami la makan kanin himpu makan piyan tarpa tangay that awareness akan mo at tool na akan in conviction kan ni so an and yun an as a university le as an institution in hard to look masay what we have occasionally done in the past so a material zo ka publish to rakha lap kon sa ve ka compile sa ve ka a manuscript nian khan bigger publishing houses sa thon pok pok ani me thon kuala ke hi milo publish sa ve thiam ti a khatia ti khanin publishing house lian hi poi mo verion san zo again sum zo am le zoang lo mo a ho sak thei lo lo thei lo ka ti zoang a ka zo am mai ro zo an reach the azawani ka ka khari ru pua ani ani ka knowledge ka it has to be out there in the world we need we need to reach you know Hey, ang ani different places di ang kami real raw kan tiyan ni so anin publishing house di anan na na so a region ni isaw ta ni so so I think that's one one way of doing it. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you, Miss Atiyang Utuke. Um, ang yez zona na idang te kan lo omem di tao 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 nila. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Hello, Miss. Katong in Shut him there. Shut him, Chaldo, Chaldo. Oh, 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 Miss. A tear trunk and color might have seen a local in Boala. Rafe no walker and load vets over. Miss, Miss Higgan, M. Zilaya. Kota sabra macuk ma, emzet itu kan mukan mukin kan ya, amel chat nih kan laut sian sian nak kan ya, amel chat nama ini pelan ma, atil so yang ini nom kopi kan tv yang kita ngah, kan ngah itu hati na, cuan, ni cina suak liat nak lah ka, English version ka mis kan ni, ka titewin kerja ka ka, kawan tu emu keronti masa. Kau kom lah kamu, 
লাল পয়ে তো সঙ্গ নি লবিন সুক লি লাজো কোক লি লাজো খা আংলিশ বারো নম চোন কত উল পেকটা ওম চুয়ান সুহান মিস রম বই চুম চাং বি খান এম এ কাজ চিল্লা খান চুম খাচু পুবানই তুং আে হৌ ও পি আভান সেউ সার ও পি আভান সেউ তে হৌ পেপার প্রেজেন সেমিনার হিয়ান চুম খাচু মাই দান পুলুক দে মাই হে কথো তো চুচু রম বই খা আহু লাই খান কন্দু লে পাতে কনপি লে পুতে হৌ তান খান আহ্রে ওম এম এ মাং থুকা থিল হ্রে ওম রাপ থাক খা অন্য না খান ওম থে তো লবং তি থুকন আমার ওচু কংল মাচুয়ান ইয়ান সের চা হি মিজৌ লিটরে চর তান সুহান মল সোম না নি আন্তি সে নাম উল খান কনপি লে পু তে তা রম বুয়াই আন চা তম তক লেন তোর তম তক খা মিজৌ লিটরে চর তান হি চুয়ান ইন আয় মল সোম নো পুই হি ওম সো সু ভাং সুহান ইন কোভিড নিচিন মিস বি জেটি নোন সুই দে ওখান কোভিড লোথে পোহি লিটরে চর চিন কাই লো থি আমি লু থিল গাই নোম তক তুর নি তিন হই মিজৌ ফি এমতে পোর সে এম সব মিজৌ ফি এম আপো কোভিড হে মিজৌ রমা কোভিড কন লো তোর দান চুম চা মিজৌ ফি এম সুক তাতে পো এন তুর ওম লে তজ খাটিং জো খান ইন কুম লাইন মাচুয়ান মাল সোম না আলো নি বেল এটাই তজেল সু ভাং চুয়ান ইন লিটরে চরা হি চুয়ান মাল সোম না আন তোর নি আহ্লোক জো কে আহু লাই চুয়ান ইন থিল ওম নি থ্রি মাসে লিটরে চর কাই লু তক তক চুয়ান ইন আলো লোক জো রাত্রা হি লোক সুয় জোক তৈ আনি থিল থ্রা আ ইন থিল থ্রা লোহিয়ান রাত থ্রা লোক সুয় জো কে তে তে খা জানি না জো না এম এম পো আনু লাই তে চু মি সে না রন সুই তা কচন চুলাই চু কারণ সুই কাই লোক চুয়ান এগল খুখোম লা ইংলিশ বার্জন চু আম থে চুয়ান কদ উলে মাই আলে আল্লাহ তো খোম খা কে আই নি আর্টিকল খামো অনলাইন হ্যাঁ নাকি না মিল রিমাইন্ডে ইমেল ইমেল খামো অনলাইন ইনক সকছে আচ্ছা তু না হ্যাঁ ফিজিকল খাবু নেই খাচু পেম লোম আই জো লা খা খাচু টুশন খামি আলব আর্টিকল খা অনলাইন হ্যাঁ চু ডিজিটাইজেশন পোমো যে চু আর খা আন ডিজিটাইজ ই লোকচন এল খা ইনে মেয়ালেম অক্সফোর্ড এন্থোলজি অফ লিটারেচর ফ্রম নর্থ ইস্ট ইন্ডিয়া খা এম জেডিউ লাইব্রেরি খাচন অমো তিলোত্তমা মিশ্রা এং লো খা খাচন ওম নি চুম আনি লো চুয়ান ও লো লো ডিজিটাইজ দান গলাই কে মাপো হ্যাঁ থি খা ফলো থাকো সিলেবাস হন সেম থার পো হিয়ান ইন রম বই লিটারেচার হি আন পাই ফল রেং রেং লো পুবি থ দিন তে তি লা তিন খান ইন হুয়ং খাতা হি আন পাই গাই লো রেং রেং ইংলিশ বার্জন ওম বে খা আহ লুরিয়া ওর চেয়ে না কেন সে লাই তান পো ไอ้ที่สวยค่ะมักกันนี่แล้วว่าเฮ้ยตุ้นมาอินปีบีเชลีตะปอนโอทูเดอะเวสต์วินด์ดาอินชะทวงอ่ะอ่าอาร์ซ
ti pui top kha kan tum lem lo mission to survivor kan ni tata wangin atlang pui chuan be dong lut tu ka ni ema ni nun na lata te pon um rualin atlang pui chuan mission re re han thil har sabit lut tu na lut tu te trauma kan ti ang tin mo kan to reng reng ha khop dan tur hi i think lo deal dan tur kha kan zong ve ni chu e khat antia lo psychologist so in mo psychologist to ni lo mai la chu wang chuan a mai ro chu khata khan deal dan e ro ain ang lo khang te zi nga khan he mi arts kan ti ang thi ho hla ani mo thu ani mo lam te po ni tho te he music ring at a thu um chuang lo music ring at te po ni theng chu khate ang si sang sang kha min ti dam tu atan le kop tu atan hyanin kan mang chhin ani pakhat na pakni na soi chwa shim shim a hyan dam na um thil reng reng har sa le na le engani nun hong dot khop kan chunga athlen hian kan upreng ai chuan kan soi chwa shim shim hian dam na um to sa ni chuan chuan in kha kha e isai kha dik chi a chuan apathum na ale chuan a hun lai ala na sat lu tuk lai le ala him chon nu tuk lai chuan soi chu har loi si mo like kan ru ru kha a process ve photangai hun ina liam pui ve de photangai chuan chuan and you know african american so po slave sal an ni kha america kha a hun lai ve kha chuan chung chwa kan tam lo เฮ้ยที่แม่ยังเต็มเต็มคันเอ่อพวกพวกเราเสียเวลามาทุนทุตัวเราเสียเวลามาคัดสุดเลยเฮ้ยเสียเลยเสียแต่คันสุดที่เ